Now we've just seen how to solve trig equations when they don't contain the same angle or they don't contain the same trig function. Let's now have a look at some tricky ones that don't contain the same angle or the same trig function. We need to change both. Now my tip is to first get all the angles the same, then get all the trig functions the same after that. Now again there will be many ways that you can do the same thing. This first question gives us two different ways that we can we can do this question and in fact I'm going to do the first way two different ways again. So here we need to solve cos of 2x is equal to 4 sine squared x minus 14 cos squared x and x must be between 0 and 2 pi so we're working in radians. Now it says to do it by changing all the angles to x the first way and then have a go at doing it by changing all of the angles to 2x. Now we're doing this example a couple of different ways so that you can get a feel for the variety that's there. Of course, most questions won't tell you how to do it and you'll just have to make your choice. Pick your favourite. Now, the first one, it says change them all to x. So that means that cos 2x has to change. So our thinking over on the side would be, all right, what is cos 2x equal? Now, if you're not sure, just jotting things over in your margin really gives you that feeling that you're making headway without actually starting on your main working. Now, cos of 2x, I remember, is cos squared x minus sine squared x. Now, is that going to work okay? Because I know that there's two other versions of this that I could come up with that only have sine squared x or cos squared x in them, not both. Well, looking at the other side, it's got sine squared x and cos squared x in it as well. So it seems to me that this version is probably fine to start with. And if it's looking like I need to, I can change sine squareds into cos squareds or vice versa later on. Okay, so let's launch into it and put down, so part A, we can see that we've got cos squared x minus sine squared x is equal to this whole side. 4 sine squared x minus 14 cos squared x. Okay, let's just tidy up. If we subtract 4 sine squared x's from both sides, we'll have minus 5 of them over here. And if we add 14 of those to each side, we'll have 15 of them over here. Now there's lots of ways that you can do this. I'm sure you can see the variety straight away. I could have these on either side. I can now, if I want, change cos squared x's into sine squared x's or sine squared x's into cos squared x's and there's even something else I can do next. Now take your pick. I'm thinking that I'll jot over on the side here that sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1. Now you might not need to do that I put these steps over here for anybody who's feeling stuck. So it's like your toolkit. What could I do next? Do some thinking and say, well, all right, that means that sine squared x must be 1 minus cos squared x. Or I could have done it the other way around. It doesn't matter too much. So let's swap out the sine squared x for this. So that's going to give me 15 cos squared x minus 5 lots of 1 minus cos squared x equals 0. So then expanding this out, I'm going to have 15 cos squared x's minus 5 plus another 5 cos squared x's. So I'm going to have 20 cos squared x minus 5 is equal to 0. Or perhaps you would have skipped ahead and said, look, I can add 5 to both sides there straight away and say that it equals 5. Either way, you could do it there or on the next line. So then cos squared x must be equal to 5 over 20, which is a quarter. So now cos x must be the plus or minus square root of a quarter, which is actually a half, because a half times a half is a quarter. So that means that I want all four quadrant answers here. Now I know that the cos of 60 degrees, which is pi on 3, is equal to a half. So I've got pi on 3, I'm working in thirds of a pi, and I want all four quadrant answers. So I want pi minus a third of a pi, I want pi plus a third of a pi, so that's four thirds, and I want 2 pi minus a third of a pi, and I get all of these answers. Okay, now how else could I have done it? Well, there's a bit of a hack that when you have your cos squareds and sine, sorry, when you have cos and sine both raised to the same power, here they're squared, but if they are all cubed or they're all to the power of 4, then there's another trick you can do which is quite handy. Back at this step here, what we could have done is we could have divided both of these terms 
by cos squared x. So let's write this down as a little note. When cos and sine are raised to the same power, you can divide by an appropriate power of cos squared x, of cos x. Now I say appropriate because we want to divide by a power that's relative to our question. So here they're both squared. So if we divide both of these terms by cos squared x, then we're going to just have 15 here because dividing this by cos squared x is going to cancel out the cos squared x's. And sine squared x divided by cos squared x gives you tan squared x. And so it just gives you a little way of getting a shortcut here. We would have had this. So then we could have added our 5 tan squared x to both sides and said that tan squared x is equal to 3. So then tan of x would have been the plus or minus root 3 and we'd get those exact same solutions. Now, whichever method you use, this one might have taken slightly more working, but then you might have done a few of these steps in your head. The person beside you might have done, gone this way and said, hey, I'm already finished, how come you're still going? The key with these is because there's so many ways to do it, if you can see a way forward, take that way. Don't stand there wondering which way to go. Just pick a method and go forward. Now, we've used two separate methods to change all the angles to x. You'll notice also that we had to change the trig functions so that they were either the same, here they were both tan x, or we changed them so they were both cos squared x. We could have also changed them so they were both sine squared x. Now let's go ahead and do it the other way. Part B, it says change everything so it's in terms of 2x. Now let's have a think about how we would do that. That means that we're leaving this one the same and we need to write these differently. So we need different thinking on the side now and we need to have memorised or take a little bit of time to come up with one of these. Now remember that we already learnt that the sine squared of x and the cos squared of x can be written as a half minus a half cos 2x or a half plus a half cos 2x. And these are really handy ones to know. I remember that the cos goes with plus, I'm not sure how I remember that, but I just do. So now over here, I can replace sine squared x with all of this, being careful not to make a sine error because I need to have four lots of that, half minus a half cos 2x, and I'm subtracting 14 lots of this, a half plus a half cos 2x. Okay, so tidying up, we've got one lot of cos 2x is equal to half of 4 minus 2 cos 2x. And here we've got minus 7 minus 7 cos 2x. So gathering things together, I can see I've got minus 2 minus 7. I've got minus 9 cos 2x here. So if I add 9 cos 2x to each side, there's already one of them over here, plus another 9, I'm going to have 10 cos 2x's, and that's going to equal 2 minus 7, which is minus 5. So now to divide both sides by that 10 there to get rid of it, I've got negative 5 over 10, so that's minus a half. And this is something familiar to me. The cos of something is minus a half. Well, I know the cos of 60 degrees is a half. So if the cos, that means that 2x, it could be a little bit like 60 degrees, but for it to be negative, remember our all stations to central, cos is negative here and here in the second and the third quadrants. So I don't want 60 degrees or pi on 3. What I want is pi minus pi on 3. I want 2 pi on 3, the second quadrant answer. And I also want third quadrant answer, which is going to be pi plus pi on 3. So that's 4 pi on 3. Now, remembering to be careful with our domains like we were before, if x has to be between these two, then 2x can afford to be twice as big. Now, that tells me that I need to go around again and not just find the second and the third quadrant answer, but the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6th and the 7th quadrant answer. Now, the easiest way to do that is just add 2 pi to these. We're dealing in thirds, and 2 pi 
is six thirds of a pi. So if I just add six thirds of a pi to each of these, two plus six, I get eight thirds of a pi. And adding six here, I get 10 thirds of a pi. I can generate my answers quite easily. And now I can just go ahead and halve all of these. I've got uh, pi on three, and I've got two pi on three, and four pi on three, and five pi on three. And they're the exact same answers that I came up with the first time. Now, was this easier or harder than the way we did it the first time? Take your pick. If you're good at memorizing these, you might have launched into this and you can finish quite quickly. Another person who has to take a lot of time to generate these because they haven't memorized them would find maybe the first method that we used much easier. So a bit of variety, try and tackle each question a different way and you'll get a feel for your favorite methods.